There's nothing I hate worse than animal cruelty, which everyone knows is what happens when an animal is being cruel. But why are animals cruel? A friend of mine recently introduced me to a worldwide phenomenon which has been using underhanded tactics like cute graphics and exciting action sequences to influence younglings, encouraging them to enslave wild animals and pit them against each other in brutal cage matches. That's right, today we're talking about Pokemon. Today's mission is simple. Bring an end to animals being cruel by utilizing the prolific Pokemon series against its own goals. In the Diabolic animated series, there are three main goals pursued by the characters. First, there is the goal of defeating the eight gym leaders in a given region, which unlocks access to the second objective, which is to defeat the Elite Four, which are like super gym leaders. Becoming a Pokemon master by pursuing these objectives is the motivation for virtually all sins against animal kind in the Pokeverse. So our objective will not be to defeat eight gym leaders plus the Elite Four, our objective will be to kill them, thus breaking the cycle forever. Finally, above and beside the progression towards Pokemon Master status is the pursuit of legendary Pokemon. Normally, this is for the purpose of taking them out of their natural habitat so that they can clown on other captured animals in a manner proportional to their mythical status. This gives us three crystal clear objectives. One, kill eight gym leaders in Norska. Two, kill the Elite Four in Norska. And three, kill all the legendary creatures in Norska. We have some limitations as well. Since this is a mission to end animal abuse and misuse, we cannot ourselves use or work alongside animals. Killing enemy animals brutally is totally fine. But if we're going to enter into a world of competitive blood sports with the intention of taking it down from the inside, we're going to need help from a source which even the most prolific competitors rely on. That's right, we're getting sponsored. Raid Shadow Legends is officially taking us to the big leagues. We're talking about a free-to-play hero collecting mobile game which not only has a vibrant roster of over 800 recruitable champions, but also a robust combat system which ties it all together beautifully. Personally, I'm fond of clan boss fights which challenge you to push your team to their limits since they last until you get wiped out and are scored based on how much damage you deal until that happens. With millions of active players, it's never been easier to get in on clan boss action. One of the most important aspects of any RPG is the endgame content, and let me tell you, Raid has got endgame content. The Doom Tower is basically a stack of bricks stuffed with all the nastiest critters from the Raid world. The elevator is out of service, which means you'll have to fight through 120 floors of passive-aggressive, actually just aggressive inhabitants, to get to the top, really testing your mettle by creating the perfect team to adapt to each of the boss's immunities and debilitating effects. For a limited time, you get easy access to the legendary champion Sun Wukong, Raid's take on the Monkey King from Chinese mythology. Simply log in on seven different days between now and October 23rd, and he's all yours. No demons to slay or journeys to the west. Just log in and get this awesome legendary champion for free. There's never been a better opportunity to get started playing Raid. Use my link in the description or scan my QR code to get significant bonuses, like this epic champion, Knight Errant, and other useful things. Now that our team is decaled out like a professional stock car, we're ready to take on the Monster League. Wolfric the Wanderer is the perfect candidate to spread the cheer and wonder of animal rights activism to the old world. His entire shtick is that he systematically grabs and smashes every single named character's souls right out of their bodies. He was basically born to be that annoying asshole who throws blood on random people in restaurants, except in this case, it's their blood. We have been given the lore appropriate equivalent of the Pokedex, which for us is a book that lists all the critters in desperate need of saving. Being listed in this book guarantees being kidnapped at a minimum, although Wolfric is very proud of his 0% survival rate for rescued animals. The Book of Monsters is therefore like a Pokedex that, instead of being given out to children to encourage them to wander off into the woods in search of wild animals, is given to serial killers to encourage them to wander off into the woods in search of wild animals. I've assembled 19 of our closest allies to bring along on this quest, mostly daring Patreon adventurers and my closest confidants, individuals who share my commitment to a better world for animals and my refusal to exploit them in my war machine. We call our gang the Breakers of the Cycle. This is actually not related to Pokemon, it's because we collectively damaged a random passerby's bicycle, and that was our most noteworthy achievement so far. As soon as we begin the game, we notice one of the Norskin gym leaders wandering around outside our camp hooting and hollering nonsense. 
we send Reggie out to see what he wants, and that doesn't exactly go well, so I guess we're doing our first gym battle already. Unfortunately, this gym leader wasn't ready for 20 of the most ripped chads I've ever met to show up and spank his entire Pokemon fan club into next week. If you've ever watched the accursed anime Pokemon, you'd know that defeating gym leaders means that they become your friends. So to honor this tradition and demonstrate our adherence to the rules, we take this kind gentleman, Snagger the Terror, and rename him Misty, along with a modest makeover. At some point, this process results in us legally acquiring Misty's house as our own property, and she gives us a cute little enamel pin to commemorate the occasion. Apparently eager to earn his own manicure, the second gym leader shows up at our camp. And while I'm trying to explain to him that we're supposed to be traveling to them and not the other way around, he throws a spear at me and kills Cal. So needless to say, he now goes by Brock, and we also get his house, along with another badge which it turns out are supposed to represent our progress towards abusing all the gym leader's pets or something. I've already got some complaints about this whole ordeal. First of all, I'm supposed to go to them. Second of all, they're supposed to use animals to do their dirty work, not fist fight me in the parking lot. While I'm on the phone with the Pokemon Gym Leaders Association trying to find out what their problem is, a third gym leader shows up with a huge army and knocks my trash bins over. Actually, they were Brock's bins I only moved in like five seconds ago. Regardless, we can't let this offense go unanswered but I can't auto-resolve my way out of this one either. Therio tells me that I should give this Pokemon battling stuff a try first if I want my criticism to be taken seriously, so we snatch a wild mammoth and some subscribers from the previous three videos and square up with this soon-to-be has-been gym rat. This gym leader is not messing around. I'm traveling with like barely 20 pals and this dude shows up with literally thousands of rare Pokemon. Luckily, I can lean on my subscribers to back me up and even the playing field a little bit. Also, I don't even think these are Pokemon, I think these are just naked men with sticks. Come to think of it, I think most of my viewers are just naked men with sticks. Does this horse I stole count? Does this qualify as a Poke Battle at all? Anyway, they're throwing their sticks at us, so I form our Pokemon flash mob up in the woods where we'll be semi-shielded and realize we're already kind of in trouble. Outnumbered and outgunned, we desperately try to hold our own as they swarm us and push us farther into the grove. Some of my subscribers reconsider their choice to come mud wrestle in the woods on behalf of a stranger on the internet and start to pack their bags to leave. Just then, I remember my favorite Pokemon, human male who can call in artillery. I think that finally some Pokemon abilities are appearing in this video because a bunch of massive metal stalactites just fell out of the sky and crushed like a hundred people to death. Imagine this, you're a naked man in the woods, who along with thousands of other naked men in the woods, are pretending to be Pokemon. This is kind of weird, you think to yourself, but hey, everyone else is doing it and we're winning, so whatever. All of a sudden, one of the dudes on the other team starts chanting, and the next thing you know, the ten people to your right are exploded by a falling meteor. Now you're thinking, holy shit, am I the only one pretending? I've got to get out of here. So yeah. Things aren't looking good for the other team. Suddenly, the guys on your left are shouting, Somebody get the Master Balls, there's a Pokemon coming out of the woods. And you think, alright, I can handle this. What's it gonna be? A Zubat? A Geodude? Maybe a Hitmonlee? And then a fucking Mammoth bursts out of the forest and sends your buddies 20 feet in the air like ragdolls. So, you've had enough at this point, and you're thinking, Okay, I definitely gotta get out of here. Then, you hear Wolfric shouting, Boat, I choose you! What? Did you hear that right? What kind of psychopath names their Pokemon Boat? I bet it's one of those stupid new Pokemon who looks like a candelabra. Okay, look, I've given this whole pokey battling thing a try, so now you guys can't judge me for ragging on it. I've experienced the pocket monsters on both sides of the arena, and I'm ready to get back to flipping these psychopaths upside down and collecting their silly badges. At this point, we've come to the realization that these gym leaders are hacks who probably never even played the original Pokemon games. We know we're just going to be punching these frauds in the face until we find some animals to euthanize when we get a letter from Throg, who is definitely the ugliest gym leader I've seen yet. Turns out, Throg is a non-human gym leader, which he thinks is going to create a conflict of interest for me. But nah, we're still gonna punch him in the face. But what should I do with all of these Pokemon cosplayers I hired? 
Throg shows up shortly after his prank call, and the auto-resolve tells me that I can defeat Throg without having to fight the battle, but it will cost me all my human soldiers. So, yeah, that's pretty convenient, and now I own Throg's stinky cave, and all my subscribers are, uh, retired. With the majority of Norska now under my control, the Gym Leaders Association calls me to remind me that technically I don't have a permit to hunt legendary monsters until I've collected all of the Gym Leader badges, and we're done with that nonsense. It's legendary Pokemon time. The Pokedex says that our first legendary creature is located at the Tower of Crack? Located at the opposite end of our starting region, Norska. Norska, it turns out, is like my YouTube comments inbox because on the short walk to the Tower of Crack, I get like 16 threatening letters from angry communists. Archaon calls me a bitch, Castalton threatens to seize my means of reproduction, some random beast man spit on me when I wouldn't give him change, and Clan Mulder straight up tripped me while I was walking by their settlement. The monster we are seeking to euthanize today is a Frostworm, which is basically what you would get if you were interrupted partway through sawing an Articuno in half. Honestly, we're doing this thing a favor. Somehow, there's multiple of these, which means it wasn't just a freak industrial accident, and I am extremely disturbed by the implications that someone is out there splitting these dudes open on the regular. Now that we're past all the environmental hazards inherent to low-income neighborhoods, we are assigned the task of harassing some hedonistic sex demons. So we break into their house and steal all their instruments of intimacy. The devastated wails of the pleasure-pursuing pixies apparently pleases the Pokedex, which now tells us where to find the monster we seek. No doubt having caught wind, pun intended, of our arrival, the freakishly hideous creature has fled south into Kislev, hoping to evade the impending mandatory Canadian healthcare. The game imposes the completely arbitrary inconvenience on us that we must first train the Norskin Ice Troll Pokémon, before the Frostworm will reveal itself on the campaign map. We can't do this easily since we've got no space left on our traveling animal rescue. So we finally make use of our bumbling companions Brock and Misty by politely encouraging them to train the Pokemon for us. Now that Brock, who is miles away, has recruited a single ice troll, we're allowed to begin the battle for some reason. Frigustrex, the abominable Snowdrake, has summoned all his equally ugly pals to try and prevent this necessary once-in-a-lifetime intervention performed by 20 of the finest veterinarians in the business. It's true that we're going to violently remove all of his internal organs, but we're professionals, so it's tasteful. Our mere 20 combatants seem massively outnumbered and outgunned by a thundering horde of trolls and soaring, but still ugly, dragons. But Frigustrex dies approximately 60 seconds after touching the ground, so I guess not. With the big guy cut the rest of the way in half, his hideous compadres huddle up together in a nearby grove, hoping our extremely humane veterinarian work will pass them by. But with socialized healthcare, everybody gets some, and the looming shadow of charity soon braces them for a final time. Next up, the game tells us to travel even further east to uncover the second Norskin legendary Pokémon. Once again, in order to find this legendary Pokémon, we have to do a quest, which is the most reductive form of walk-here assignments imaginable. We have to choose between wasting a turn raiding a province or paying 1500 gold, which is virtually nothing to us at this point. Just let me do the battle already. Finally, Treyguard, protector of cafeteria food carriers, emerges with an entourage of lunch ladies and municipal school janitors. I haven't seen a Pokémon like this before. I assume it is what Entei would look like if he were a lumberjack. This is starting to feel like what would happen if Pokémon were art-directed by Clive Barker. At least the game saved our formation from the last battle, so that's nice. I want to tell you that I originally intended to conduct this combat in a manner invoking the original Pokémon games. But these absolute maniacs refused to fight fair, so I had to give up on that plan since one-on-one -on -one combat never happens. Oh, would you look at that. I completely changed the entire premise of the video, and this actual Muppet decides to charge me all by himself just this time. Needless to say, 20 simultaneous injections of high school cafeteria mashed potatoes directly into his bloodstream by our veterinarian clinicians proves fatal. Treyguard expresses shock at his record-breaking speedrun of the dying process, get it, cause he uh, shoots lightning, while we perform somewhat less sophisticated mass production euthanasia on his now unemployed cafeteria staff posse. Two-thirds of Norska's mythical animals have been spared from ever being imprisoned in a Pokeball, which is a very satisfying achievement. But we have one more and yes, there's walking. 
I have to go to Winterpyre. Okay. Now I have to go to Krakadrak. Okay. Now I have to go to Fort Stragov. Okay. Now I have to go to Novchazi. Okay. Oh, wait. I didn't even have to do that last one. I could have tell. God damn it. We arrive on the scene of the final legendary creature on our philanthropic hit list, and wait, they're on our team? Distressingly, this battle involves saving animals. I have no choice but to protect these mammoths, but ultimately the trade-off is acceptable because we end up getting to massacre dwarves for about half an hour. Their artillery gives a few of our sturdy beefcakes a headache, but does little to prevent the slaughter which follows. Our champions so effortlessly handled the dwarves in combat that this entire battle is basically each of our warriors off on their own, leisurely stuffing the dwarves into the ground up to their helmet and then either creating a garden of angry dawi heads or getting some driving practice in. With all the legendary creatures of Norska either euthanized or enlisted for compulsory military service, the game didn't give me a choice, okay? Now we just have to eliminate the Elite Four. Unfortunately, killing the entire region's roster of gym leaders and shiny Pokémon apparently isn't good enough to qualify for the Elite Four, and we have to earn our right to challenge them by burning down settlements in the name of some pagan god until they get annoyed enough to come try and stop us. Our natural victim of this requirement is Kislev, and we waste no time traveling there to spread the word of minimalist living. Oh boy, they are not pleased with me. This does not look good. Guys, I think I may have overextended on this one. We try to use our normal shenanigans to take cover in the trees, but bear-drawn shopping carts are upon us before we can find our footing. It seems at first like we have the upper hand as our melee strikes deal disgusting amounts of damage to the Russian cavalry, but we risk an attempt to reach the larger and more tactically valuable forest, but this turns out to be a disastrous error. Caught out in the open, midway between the two places where we may have had safe refuge, three full-sized armies converged on us from every direction, all at once. It was at this point that I realized I had erred greatly, and with nothing left to do but watch, I prepared to witness the premature extermination of my Pokémon team before my very eyes. However, after a few minutes of completely chaotic fighting, I see all 20 of my champions still hacking, swinging, and generally causing a ruckus as the corpses pile all around them. In a fashion invoking the death of the Thermopylaean Spartans, Kislevite archers and gunners rain projectiles down upon our shirtless barbarian, and yet they continue to fight. Even our wizard, who is by far the least durable, is going strong and pulverizing his adversaries. Kostalton and his various lieutenants each fall to our vicious blades, and before long each of the enemy armies are fully routed. I realized then that our Patreon posse was far more dangerous than I had originally suspected. Having cut the head from the snake, it is a simple matter to burn what remains of the Great Orthodoxy to the ground in the name of summoning the Elite Four. Just as the final settlement is engulfed in flame, we receive news that the Empire has decided to declare war on us. This is perfect, now we have far more offerings to give, which will speed up our progress significantly. The other Kislevite faction is quick to colonize the ruins we leave in our wake, which creates an unfortunate situation in which we are leaving our home completely undefended against a now monstrously overpowered and unfriendly neighbor. Luckily for us, having never trained any armies and spending a lot of time winning battles means we are replete with gold for which we have little use. This makes placating the Serena an effortless chore. With nothing to worry about at our rear, we strike deep into the heart of the Empire in search of carnage sufficient to please our patron deities. This is obviously a great deal of work just to get these Elite Four nerds to come out of their hiding places and pokebattle us, but I suppose it is our fault that we have to take this roundabout approach, since the normal method, which is defeating the gym leaders and collecting their badges, went awry after we started publicly executing them in the Pallet Town Square. While my elite crew and I discuss the merits of animal rights activism and other pressing matters, such as the usefulness of artificial intelligence, the Empire launches a surprise attack on our camp in the hinterlands of Talabekland. The Empire forces are at a great advantage as they fall upon us and successfully break our formation apart. The battle quickly devolves into scattered Pokémon trainers fending off hordes of adoring fans while trying to avoid getting swarmed. The Empire demonstrates its tactical superiority over the dwarves we faced earlier by nearly killing our wizard mere moments after the fighting begins. Enemy reinforcements begin to arrive as we struggle to regain control of the situation, which escalates the jeopardy we find ourselves in significantly. 
Some of our gang are able to fight their way back into the woods where they can mitigate the artillery and rifle fire, but not all of us. As our stragglers desperately aim to fight their way to the rest of the group, a heroic charge assisted by our still alive mage's magic enables a rendezvous. At this point, we break into three distinct groups and pursue three simultaneous and vital objectives. Wolfric takes the healthiest of the bunch back into the fray, tying down the bulk of the Imperial forces while punishing volumes of gunfire find their marks, proving that if our other two teams do not complete their objectives quickly, we may soon find ourselves facing a complete collapse. Team 1 reaches the enemy's rearmost artillery units and disrupts them as Team 2 successfully sneaks up on the enemy's powerful Luminarch, capable of dealing uncomfortably large amounts of damage to our heroes. Seeing that the other teams have completed their objectives, Wolfric and his group fight their way back into the tree line with the Imperial Army hot on their trail. Only now, their artillery support is ominously quiet, and two-thirds of our forces are dangerously unaccounted for by the Empire. Shortly after they follow us in, only a few terrified survivors come running out, our forces victoriously striding back onto the battlefield with many new skulls to display on their impractical shoulder decorations. With the Empire's vanguard annihilated, we make quick work of the towns and cities east of the capital until we have accumulated enough favor to initiate the appearance of the Elite Four. Unfortunately, one of the Elite Four decides to join us right at the outset. I can't say I blame him, but he won't get off his mount, and as you know, we simply cannot abide by that, so we arrange to have him dealt with Sicilian style. The second member of the Elite Four is a fucking bird and kills himself on my garrison before I even get a chance to fight him, so thanks a lot for that, I guess. How are these guys seriously the Elite Four we've heard so much about? We march to meet the third champion, whom we beat so badly he converts from a Chaos Overlord to an Empire Captain, and then dies after receiving a parking ticket. With three quarters of the Elite Four being defeated, mostly by themselves, the final challenger appears so that we can bring an end to our mission at long last. We teleport into a battle against an impressive host of heavily armored Pokemon poachers headed unsurprisingly by a man riding an animal, like some kind of sadistic enslaver. We charge the enemy lines, sending some of our most capable heroes to break free and destroy the troublesome enemy hell cannons but the heavily armored opponents play an effective defense and do not allow us through. Wolfric leans into his specialization of killing heroes and makes quick work of the enemy general, but alarmingly this does nothing to slow down the enemy infantry, who continue to put up fierce resistance. To make matters worse, a contingent of wild animals bursts onto the battlefield in defense of the enemy. Do those ignorant beasts not know how hard we are working to put them to rest? Everything from mammoths to minotaurs get into the fray in an attempt to put an end to our quest. Although, with the final member of the Elite Four dead, it is already in vain. Regardless, one of our mighty Jarls goes down swinging, surrounded by contemptible creatures. There you have it. We have turned Norska into a land of eternal bliss for creatures of all shapes and sizes. I hope you've enjoyed this Eli Mazenary expedition exposing the enslavement of exotic entities. This is the end of the video, so only continue to watch if you are a true fan. First of all, I'd like to thank my patrons for their support. They enable me to put a great deal more time into this, which not only benefits me, but it benefits everyone who enjoys the content. So I thank them on behalf of not only myself, but for the viewing community who enjoy this content as a whole. In the members category, we have Nick Extreme, Dear Kralt, Quake Riley, Eric Bialasic, and Dan Campbell. In the helpers category, we have Hayden, no last name, Space Drake, Mathis Faf, Red Ice, Rollout123, and Thorkel the Tall. I'd also like to invite you to join our Discord community, which is quite active and hosts regular giveaways, events, and has many friendly Warhammer players fielding frequent multiplayer sessions. One last thing, please remember to check out Raid Shadow Legends using my QR code to get some major bonuses for new players along with an epic champion.